Well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. Today we are joined by Dr. Cameron Giasi, a senior chemist and team lead in our rocket propulsion division, to discuss STEM outreach, satellite propulsion, and how teamwork makes the dream work. In three, two, one. Hi, Cam. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. Now, you sit in our rocket propulsion division uh, that, you know, Air Force has a location at Edwards Air Force Base out in the desert of California. You guys like to call yourselves the Rocket Lab. We don't officially call it that, but we all know what we're talking about when we say Rocket Lab. So earlier in another episode of the podcast, we got to talk to Sean Phillips, who's kind of over your division. And he, he got to talk to us about, you know, desert tortoises and, you know, space fuel, all these things we heard about in Netflix's Space Force, but you really, you're just on this podcast today to talk to us about the Big Bang Theory, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here today to discuss the uh, misconceptions of scientists and engineers and how we relate to the Big Bang Theory. And if there's time, of course, we can talk a little bit about career advice, I guess. Sounds like a plan. So, I mean, do you see yourself in the Big Bang Theory? So, I like telling stories and ask anybody who knows me, sometimes they may not be the shortest. This one I'll try and make worth your while. I was a, a young buck in grad school. I was, uh, this was 2013, 2014. I was leading a, uh, a laboratory class. So I'm teaching this class and all the students are like, Cam, did you see the Big Bang Theory? Have you ever seen it? You, you're, you're like Sheldon. And I've never seen the Big Bang Theory up until that point. So I, I saw an episode and I thought that I told the student next time I saw them, I, very politely, I said, that is probably the most egregious insult you can ever give a scientist or an engineer. And they were like, oh, I'm so sorry, Cam. I didn't mean anything bad by it. And I'm like, no, 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 it's all good. I like the... Big Bang Theory is a fun show. I saw a couple episodes after that. It's not too bad. The problem, though, is that it portrays scientists and engineers in a way that is, uh, it makes us all unanimously, or at least this is the interpretation I got, it made us all look like socially inept geniuses. Number one, we're not geniuses. Number two, not all of us are socially inept. Okay, a lot of us are, <laughs> be honest, but like, like me, clearly. But, you know, it just... It's not a fair depiction because I know a lot of people that are told, this is why I mentioned this. The Big Bang Theory, at least the interpretation that I originally had was that none of these guys and gals were approachable. You know, you're too, one would be too scared to even ask them a question. And by and large, at least where I work at the Rocket Lab or the, uh, you know, the, the boonies out at Edwards Air Force Base. We'll talk about that, the location probably later on. But most of us actually can hold a conversation, look at you in the eye when we talk. You know, it's just, it's very misleading, this show. And I say that with jest. It does television well. I mean, that show is highly ranked and all that. But it doesn't really speak to the everyday average scientist or engineer on the bench I mean, don't get me wrong, you do see some of these folks and they're spot on depictions of Sheldon, but, you know, they're not, not exactly the most social folk now, are they? No, we, we've definitely uh, met a lot of, you know, scientists and engineers that could have the same job titles as characters from the Big Bang Theory. But, you know, this podcast is supposed to show a little bit of the people behind the science and you guys have personalities and you don't, you don't have just one pair of pants you wear when you ride the bus like Sheldon. And, you know, there's empathy, feelings, you know, you probably cry and laugh sometimes. You might enjoy a cup of tea, all the stereotypes. But uh, yeah, definitely, definitely some personalities in our laboratory. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the motto in our group, uh, jokingly or not, is Friday Cry Day. So. so going back in your personal history, this idea of trying to figure out how things work, uh, you mentioned to us beforehand that uh, a liquid nitrogen experiment helped really get you interested in chemistry, kind of what you do now. Can you kind of go into that history and what that's all about? Sure. So when I was in college, very, very young, long time ago, so I had an instructor and this instructor, she's a professor at CSUN, 
And she did uh, community outreach. And what she ended up doing was uh, what we called in the department liquid nitrogen demos, liquid nitrogen demonstrations. What we would do, and I got involved like first week of uh, my freshman year because I love one, I love outreach. Two, I, I mean, uh, I love uh, liquid nitrogen. I'll go over why I became a chemist uh, a little after, but it's along the same lines. And the liquid nitrogen demonstrations, you basically would pour out liquid nitrogen put it in a doer, and then you you show it next to a glass of water. And then one of the things you do is you show the kids, hey, look, they're both colorless liquids, right? But if you put your hand in water, nothing happens. You put your hand in liquid nitrogen, you get frostbite, you know? They didn't touch the liquid nitrogen, obviously. Things that we would do, you would take a rubber ball, freeze it in liquid nitrogen, you bounce it beforehand so they know that you're not doing any, you know, you know, magic or any of that. And then you freeze the rubber ball, you break it by throwing it and it shatters and they're all mesmerized by that. And then you see as the day goes on, uh, you know, a couple minutes later or whatever, the, the ball warms up and those glass shards that broke it, you know, all of a sudden now it's rubbery again. They're amazed by that. And as kids, that's more captivating to see that sort of demonstration right before your eyes than to go into the nerdy explanation behind it saying, well, liquid nitrogen freezes the rubber uh, from the rubber state past the gland, uh, glass transition point. It forms a glass and that's what actually causes the breakage in terms of the mechanicals. You know, kids, I mean, high school, middle school, elementary school kids have no idea what I just said. And I barely understand it, you know? So the other experiments that would go into this would be uh, breaking a rose petal, like a rose flower by freezing the petals. You can shatter that. The, their favorite, because they got to eat, they would take a graham cracker, dip it into the liquid nitrogen, eat it. And then the condensation, the smoke, if you will, would come out of their nostrils and they, yeah, it was, it's great. So the liquid nitrogen demonstrations that, that I, I mentioned before the podcast was one of the primary reasons that I got into outreach and chemistry. But, um, you know, it, it's one of the reasons I love teaching. Uh, so I, I was an instructor, too, part time uh, while I was at the lab. And I love teaching while I was in Davis. And I also was a, an instructor at uh, Cal State Northridge in my later years as an undergrad. Seeing the expression on somebody's face, that click moment when they finally understand that aha, that light bulb, and if you want to go with the cliche expressions for it, seeing an, another person understand a very difficult concept, I mean, that's just, that, that to me, that, that, that gives you the feels because especially kids, no, no but let, let's bring it, let's bring it even further, especially uh, helping out students, first generation college students, where they may or may not make it, to be able to assist in their success, to be able to outreach elementary, middle and high school students that they wouldn't even have the knowledge to know what chemistry is, but then you planted that seed early on in their life. I mean, who knows? They may be quite literally, they may be your physician one day. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on on this one, but I'll let you guys steer the ship on this. Well, that's what I think is so cool about this is the fact that, um, especially in regards to chemistry, I mean, I remember back when I was learning in high school, a lot of these hands-on outreach experiments, whether it be my teacher or other folks coming in to show us uh, things like uh, working with um, a liquid nitrogen or even doing um, contained, like uh, I say explosions, not really. They use fire to show how a contained reaction could take place on your desk and not injure anybody, just how, how cool chemical reactions are. And um, it's I think that hands-on science is important because on paper, you can explain anything uh, in and out. But um, even I had difficulty with organic chemistry. Like I looked at it, and it was, I mean, a lot of these numbers didn't make sense to me. But seeing it happen, I'm like, okay, I can see the direct result of how this affects an experiment or why we'd want to research this. So, I mean, that outreach is super important. Did you guys ever put a peep in a vacuum? Because that's what we did in, in high vacuum? school. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I've heard of that experiment. I have never actually done that one. Yeah, in foods and, or experiments involving candy. The one that we did at AFRL is we put a gummy bear inside a bomb calorimeter to measure the combustion of sugar and how much heat that produces. 
the vessel gets so hot you can barely touch it without getting burned the kids love that uh it's yeah otherwise we try not to bring food into the laboratory for obvious reasons but no i have not done the peep and vacuum one not yeah, yet at well, least well now not i yet. need to catch a, a gummy gummy beer on fire you know i gotta put that on the list <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's where I was going next is saying a lot of these outreach programs are so important. And, and while we will go back to kind of talking about your connection to AFRL, I mean, we would love to hear, like, are, is your team currently doing anything uh, with uh, outreach? Like you said, bringing kids to the labs, showing gummy bears on fire. Like, what do you do to help engage that community to get these young minds excited about STEM? Well, we do a, we do a couple of things. And I'm glad you brought it up because this is one of my favorite. I mean, even though I'm a scientist by training, I mean, my primary job is mentoring and helping people get to wherever they need to go because of uh, the nature of my work as a group leader. But how our group, how my group specifically interacts with these outreach programs. So I'll give you some examples. We have on occasion have elementary and middle school and high school students I think only really middle and high school elementary is too young that I've been at the lab, but we have them come visit our site and basically do like tours and show them around, show them the rocket stands, show them where, um, where the cool chemistry happens. And uh, the, the second thing that we do is we go to them. Okay. So again, we can do liquid nitrogen demonstrations at the local schools in our area. We have done that. We're still active. Not obviously now due to the coronavirus thing, uh, pandemic, but we, we, before this, uh, before this, uh, pandemic took off, we were very, very active a couple times a year. Uh, a group of us it wasn't necessarily me, but we'd go out into the community, go to the local schools and, uh, do demos. Uh, I also gave a classroom talk, a career day, if you will, where you get to go visit kids' uh, classrooms, and basically they get to ask you questions. You give a little, say, kind of like this podcast, but in five minutes for high school, and it, it's it's very, very humbling and heartwarming just to see how much interest that they have, because usually at least one person in there wants to do something relating to aerospace. And given where we work, it's actually more than one person per uh, class, and that, that's always good. The other, the last thing probably that we do, my group directly, we have uh, high school, college, grad school, and postdoc opportunities. We usually have a couple interns a year come in and work in our laboratory. Uh, that would be summer of 2019. We had a cadet from the Air Force Academy uh, you know, all of what, 19 years old. She came and visited the lab and she ended up on a patent as a co-inventor. Uh, we've wow. had, yeah, we've had high school students. She, uh, we had one high school student that was, that's on two peer reviewed papers that are published. We had an intern this year, even though there's a pandemic, she got to work in the lab all of four weeks and she basically produced half of the results for a paper that we're just about to start writing up right now. This will be her second or her third paper. So I and in these internship opportunities, I mean, yeah, they're great for us. Don't get me wrong. But the reason I do it is because we're setting these kids up for success. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of them wants to go to pharmacy school. If you're if you're applying to pharmacy school, it's expected that you have undergraduate research under your belt. OK, to have an undergrad with two peer reviewed papers in pretty good journals. I mean, that's just that brings your application to the next level. That's why I do what I do, helping these kids get to where they want to go in the future. It's just it's an awesome opportunity. Yeah, really, really building our future when we invest in STEM and, and invest in these, you know, air quote kids. But you know, to have teenagers, you know, in, you know, working directly with you and learning from you, that's, and you can learn something from them too. It's just really cool or to, you know, be that 19 year old cadet and, you know, that she's already on a patent. How, how amazing is that for her career and, and what she'll continue to contribute to our Air Force and world? That's, that's so neat just to hit the ground running like that. I know that you work with the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, AFOSR, which is part of AFRL. You know, what is AFOSR and how do they help you and how do you help them? 
The Air Force Office of Scientific Research, AFOSR, is the Air Force's equivalent of the NSF. Now, if anybody from AFOSR or upper management or the Pentagon is listening, uh, that's my interpretation of it. These views are those of my own. They do not actually reflect the big Air Force. But the A uh, AFOSR, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, basically provides us with a funding mechanism to do 6-1 research. And what is 6-1 research? 6-1 is basic research. It is the research that you see at the universities. It is the distribution A, the publicly releasable research that allows us to get to the technology of, of tomorrow. Without basic research, we can't really advance science or the state of the art because we don't have that fundamental understanding that is absolutely developed from funding sources like AFOSR, from basic or fundamental research. So what does AFOSR do for our site? Well, in addition to providing the funds, they also provide mechanisms to collaborate with universities. And in fact, some program officers mandate that there is some interaction with the laboratory that actually might be a requirement now for AFOSR. Um, I'd have to double check, but it really helps bridge the gap between academia, government, and even industry. So AFOSR really, really is the bread and butter for the for the Air Force and AFRL. Uh, it, it's the bread and butter for our basic research projects. You you mentioned that they provide one thing they do is provide funding and probably some general direction like the NSF, which is the Ni National Science Foundation. So, but this is within the Air Force. And then you talk about basic research, and I didn't know what basic research was until I came to work for the Air Force Research Laboratory. And you said it's fundamental science. Could you give us an example in case we do have any listeners that are in maybe they're in the Air Force, but they don't they're learning about what AFRL does, or they're not a scientist or engineer? Sure. Before before diving into the the Air Force's view on it, my my take on it in a in a simplified version, the difference between basic, fundamental, or applied research. Some people, again, as with everything in life, certain people will split hairs over syntax. To me, basic and fundamental research mean the same thing. It is what you use to develop and your understanding of a system. Applied research is essentially how to make that system, once it's advanced a little bit, how to make that work for a specific application. Again, this is my interpretation of it. This is obviously, as with most things in life, as I said, this is probably uh, open to debate, but let's just for, you know, for intent and purpose, let's stick with this. Basic and fundamental research allows you to understand a problem or understand a system. Applied research, on the other hand, is, is how do you make it work? And there is an intricate marriage between the two. You need basic research to get to applied research. And if you ever have problems in applied research, they need to be answered by basic. So where does this apply in terms of AFRL? More or less, it's what I, what I said, although some people may switch up the jargon or you know, they may expand or redact some of this, uh, some of what I was saying. For example, I have a colleague that really, really delineates between basic and fundamental research. And that's well and good, you know, ever, but there, there are subtle nuances that are there. But in terms of AFRL, just to tie it home, AFRL, uh, where I work, the Aerospace Systems Directorate, Rocket Propulsion Division, Propellants Branch, okay, just the full name if anybody's ever interested. We, as an organization, RQR, the Rocket Propulsion Division, we are only provided 6.2 and 6.3 funds usually mainly 6-2, applied research funds. We have to compete for the basic research, the 6-1 funds, and it has to still be in the scope of the Rocket Propulsion Division, uh, our mission. 
And obviously that has to line up with the Aerospace System Directorate, and that has to line up with AFRL, and that has to line up with the Pentagon. You see where this is going. So we can't just be like academia and have complete freedom. And that's where I'm a little envious of them in a good way. Academia, you can research a cool problem and not necessarily have a direct application. But at AFRL, everything needs to be tied in to the next step called tech transition or you know tech transfer. It's one of those things that we can't just go off and uh, try and do research on how to additively manufacture ceramic unicorns. You know, it, it just it isn't going to fly because there's no customer at the end. But the Air Force and our site agree wholeheartedly that basic research leads to applied research. You need both. And there is a nice marriage between the two. I hope this answers the question. Get the big picture that, you know, AFOSR is maybe the big level scoping what we're, we're investing in and basic research for the Air Force and, and now the Space Force too, you know, as, as they serve both of both services through one laboratory. So, you know, what's what's an example of what you're working on at that basic research level and then help us understand how it could move to that fundamental and applied, you know, what do we, what, what basic things do you, are you trying to figure out phenomena wise or uh, basic research wise? That's a good question. I'll give you a couple of examples. So one of the one of the projects that we are currently working on, we're developing new satellite propellants to be used in electric propulsion. So it's a mouthful. Let's break it down. The the materials that we're working on are basically what uh, what a normal person would call like fuel for a car, right? Although there's a definition associated with fuel versus like, let's say an oxidizer, but that doesn't apply in electric propulsion. What is electric propulsion? That's a question for somebody that works in, uh, in on spacecraft and well beyond my, uh, my little understanding. But basically what we're trying to do is create new ionic liquids, liquids that are, uh, that are salts, basically. They're made of plus charges and minus charges. And we're developing quote unquote next generation because everybody loves that phrase. We're creating these next generation ionic liquids that you can basically use to propel a satellite in outer space. And the other projects that are that are leading to a better understanding, but they, they may not you know they may not be useful in the long run, we're developing new catalysts that can be deactivated by the flip of a switch. Now, this flip of the switch isn't literal. It's an external stimulus by using heat or light or friction or something that basically takes your catalyst, turns it off permanently. That way it can't do any more reactivity or any more reactions because uh, you can imagine a catalyst is used to make a whole host of materials. But when you're done with the catalyst, if it still lingers around, it can actually degrade your system as well. So you, we need a way to shut that down permanently. Uh, up front, we're not having a terrible amount of luck because uh, as you can imagine, the catalysts like to do things that we uh, can't even comprehend or control. But we, uh, we've made a lot of different uh, catalysts now and we're learning a lot, but unfortunately, just with the direction that our site is going, this is going to be one of those projects that will probably be phased out. Because again, we need to stay mission relevant. And unfortunately, this one just doesn't, uh, this one probably won't survive the cut. But let's say we focus on the satellite propellants then, which, um, you know, you're having uh, success with and, and your site has had set success with like, you know, the green propellant that went up on the GPIM mission and things like that most recently. So at the basic research level, if, if I'm translating this and I'm learning as, as we're talking now, so you you have these uh, material of, of crystals and things like that and, and, you're, and you're researching how it works, but, the, but then the application gets to the point that it's going to be better for our satellites to move if they just need to move in general or if someday like we're having them, you know, avoid collision of with debris or something, this would be something that could be on the satellites and this is a, a better fuel basically. For uh, just a couple of clarifications, the GPIM mission 
was predominantly for uh, chemical propulsion. So that actually involves combustion. You have, a, it, in this case, the material served as a monopropellant and it decomposed to give you your thrust gases. And that's what created the movement of the satellite. Electric propulsion does not have the same thrust capacity as chemical propulsion. So what you're doing, imagine the electro spray or electric propulsion, the, the form that I'm talking about, operates like this, electro sprays do. Imagine that you, ha you zap, literally with electricity, you zap some of the propellant, you create ions, and those ions discharge into outer space. Physics laws say that when you have an ejection of particles, that's going to move the satellite ever so slightly in the opposite direction. And it's a very, very fine movement. That's why I'm saying it's not the same thrust. You don't get the same huge movement that you would in chemical, but you can envision that these fine movements could be used for reorienting the satellite ever so precisely and really operate fine movements versus coarse, if that makes sense. See, that's fascinating. So the idea then is that you're actually able to do have far better articulation of these craft if you're able to get this up there. So like you said, you're able to either refocus on something. If there is something coming its way, you could very easily make sure subtly move it out of the way uh, and make sure that really it just ensures that this device keeps working at a maximum of capability with little effort. So would that be something controlled from here then? You can just very easily type that in, micro adjust, carry on, or would this be more automated where it's, it knows, hey, I need to adjust to keep this focus? I would hazard, this is not my field, I would hazard a guess to say that it's both. It's for sure the first one because that, you know, you have to, you, when you want to move a satellite that has to, it has to have some manual input, but I'm sure that there, by now there's some automated process to keep it in an optimal position, probably related to the sun if it's solar powered, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, but the, the one thing I want to mention, though, to really tie back to what Michelle was saying, this is a basic research project that may be useful down the line, but not necessarily the ideal solution. Why do I say this? If you wanted to do those fine articulation moments, Ken, the, your, your movements that you were talking about, Ken, uh, they have other devices on the spacecraft that can do that. But one of the things that basic research provides is another path to accomplishing the same goal. Because you never know. It, it, I mean, I hate to say it, but there is no one size fits all solution when it comes to research and development. Otherwise, I mean, we'd all be unemployed, let's be real. Yeah, I wouldn't have anything to talk about. But no, that makes sense now, because and that, that is the idea, that this is something that we're researching now, that we don't know exactly what the application is, exactly what it is, but we think someday it's gonna be useful, just like some guy 70 years ago or something was figuring out how the computer mouse might work before you know most people even knew what a computer was. And, you know, and the Air Force DOD, like we're funding that sort of stuff. That's what this is about. So, and, you know, someday when someone else is listening to podcasts or whatever they do in the future, I mean, you know, maybe they'll talk about this propellant, you know, electric propulsion, which I've never even heard of until today. So I, I think that helps me and probably our listeners that are less versed in basic research and in your day job, understand what you do at, at part of the time. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I never knew what electric propulsion was until I started here. You know, I mean, it's something that you you learn as you go. In chemistry, it's called electrospray, and we use electrosprays all the time. For example, like I was talking about when we were referring to pop culture, gas chromatography, if you have a mass spectrometer coupled to that, that works ex almost exclusively by some sort of electrospray and nebulization which is how the satellite propulsion actually works. And that actually bridges the two between, uh, let's say like a scientist and an engineer. Two ways of looking at something, you need that communication between both parties and then you can come up with something truly amazing. 
Um, but I was wondering, though, um, connecting a lot of this together, uh, part of our conversation, our, our pre-conversation we had before talking to you here, um, you mentioned something along these basic research lines and the work you do uh, with the Applied Materials Group with this kind of idea of tech pull versus tech push. Uh, can you kind of go into what that means and how that affects your day-to-day -day or your group's actions? It's a very, very nuanced question. And it's, it's similar to what, what Michelle was saying. Let's look at tech push, technology push. We may be working on something relevant, but not necessarily have an immediate customer, but it's still important to look at right now. That way it's on the shelf, ready to go when the need arises. That is what I would consider tech push. And as with everything, some people may split hairs over the definition. This is just my interpretation of these things. Versus tech pull is when you have an immediate customer, an immediate need, they say, we need this technology now, then that's what's driving the bus. They are pulling for the technology. So at our site, it is a mix of both. But right now, the dominating atmosphere is tech pull because of programs that are really, really uh, emphasizing the cutting edge technology like additive manufacturing and um, things of that nature. And, and that makes sense because, you know, tech push, tech pull, the nuances of it. The basic idea that I see is that AFRL is looking to solve, you know, our airmen, our space professionals problems that exist today because they told us they need it, but we're also working with them to imagine what they might have a problem with in the future, along with, you know, being experts in your own field to imagine, you know, to have that thing ready to go because we've been working on it for decades when we get to that point. It's it's today and tomorrow's technology. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is where the age old problem of money comes in. Ideally, in a perfect world, we'd like to fund everything. And if everybody had the resources they need, there's no issue. You have, I don't want to say 50-50, but you have a lot of people working on tech push, the really innovative technology that really, really, you know, thinks outside the box. And you, are, you have a substantial amount of tech pull as well, solving real world problems that we need answers to right now. So yeah, it's a very, very tough balancing act, I would say, especially given the funding climates. Uh, you know, it's it's just, it is what it is. But if you look across AFRL, you know, for our listeners, you think about, you know, problems that we don't think about, you know, existing right now, like we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're all recording this episode from home. But, you know, earlier in the year, um, you know, actually on our Facebook channel, we talked to a uh, epidemiologist or microbiologist who had been preparing for a pandemic for a good portion of her career because she was thinking about this problem that the general public wasn't concerned about probably you know elements of you know other parts of our society weren't worried about but here she is worrying about that problem knowing that it could happen the same way that you're worrying about a problem that could happen in the future from a basic kind of research level and i, I guess that's the cool part that there's these people at afrl and dod that are you know looking forward into the future because you know, they might be a, a military problem initially, but they, they could really be uh, have societal implications. You know, if we're talking about space, I've learned about, oh, you know, things collide in space. I mean, I, I can see that from probably like a Sandra Bullock movie or Matt Damon or someone in space, you know, that they have problems with stuff hitting, hitting their spacecraft and what terrible that is. But then if we also think about how I rely on satellites every day to do my, jo my, my job and my life and, and navigate places, wouldn't it be a problem if, you know, things hit our satellites? But we have people that are worried about, you know, space situational awareness or finding different ways to, to move those satellites and micro adjust and stuff. So I don't know. I, I see that's how it all comes together to my everyday life, uh, th this push and this pull. Yeah, that's honestly, that's the nuts and bolts of it. It, it's when you think about the landscape of research and development or science and engineering or STEM or STEAM, or there's so much that one can do and research and still be relevant to some customer down the line. It really is an awesome time to be a scientist. I mean, the technology has gotten so much better in terms of chemistry from like, say, the 1960s. It's, it's what, what used to be somebody's dissertation, five years worth of work 
is now the equivalent of something you can do in one week. It's fascinating. And I'm, in this case, I'm referring to something called X-ray crystallography. So tying a lot of that together, a thread we've had through this podcast is the importance of communications in terms of uh, what technology you're working on or what applied research you're doing. And having people, whether it be um, our fans listening to this podcast or a family member understanding what you do, uh, why is it so important to be at least, uh, or what's the importance, I should say, of uh, communications in the STEM world? And uh, why is it so important to you specifically? It's a point that you made when we kind of first talked about this, um, like why you like to make really uh, tout that idea of being a good science communicator. Why is it important to communicate with other people, l let alone the science aspect of it? If you are a brilliant person in your field, but you can't articulate your, your results, that obviously has a problem because then you can't convey the importance, you can't convey the significance, you can't convey why it's even relevant. Now, couple all of that, you know, that, that's where you get the Sheldon, if you will, from the Big Bang Theory. If you cannot communicate, and this was going back to what I was saying about out, outreach and intimidation and all that, being able to communicate your results, not just to anybody, but the general public. I mean, these are the United States tax dollars that fund basic and applied research. We are obligated, not just we should, we are obligated to provide uh, some of these, uh, these things back to the public. We owe the taxpayers an explanation of how their money is used and one example of this you can you know we have we have to deal with is the freedom of information act sometimes we get requests for specific uh, pieces of information but the point of the, the 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 fact is if you can't communicate your results to people then how do like when a funding decision comes down how do you know that you, you may have the best science in the world but if you can't convey the importance, for example, you won't get funded. Uh, do you have any ad advice or you know best practices that you use in your life to communicate as a scientist? Absolutely. I was told uh, in college early on uh, this gem of a quote, and it stuck with me for, well, now it's been, let's see, college, uh, 10 years. This quote in my mind is 10 years old. This professor told me, Cam, if you really know something, you should be able to explain it to your grandmother. I've heard several quotes in the years that basically say the same thing. If you really know a subject, you should be able to explain it to a five-year-old, your mom, your dad, somebody who's not in your field, etc. You see where this is going. My advice on how to be an effective communicator uh, especially in science and engineering, is if you truly know a subject, you should be able to, and you should practice, uh, explaining it to many, many different levels. For example, if you are communicating with a peer in your field, it could go something like this. Yes, the propellants that we made, the conductivity is sufficient, it should be able to be uh, launched using electrospray or tested using electrospray, and that's peer-to-peer. -peer. If you explain it to management, you would say something like, yes, the conductivity is 50% more efficient, the thermal stability is surpasses the state of the art. Okay, that's cool. And then what happens if you need to explain it to a five-year-old? Then we would say something like, well, what do you, so what do you do? Cam, what do you do? I make or we make, our group makes uh, propellant or fuel to make satellites move around in space. You know, they don't necessarily need all the gory details. I love the expression or the quote, know your audience, because it's absolutely paramount to read and know your audience, usually before you have uh, whatever meeting that you attend, it's, it's absolutely paramount to communicate at the appropriate level. Otherwise, you're just gonna lose your audience. So being an effective communicator in STEM, it's not only important for the job, because you know if, if you wanna, for example, submit a proposal to somebody and they may not be a you know PhD chemist, 
you need to be able to explain something that anybody would understand to convey the importance of your work, the impact, and you know any data or results that come up along the way. Absolutely. And, and even if you're not a confident public speaker and you're, you're just in a meeting and you need to say this, I know that when I hear the science jargon and, I, and I'm not a scientist, I, I have a business background, you know, it's like that scene from Fer, Ferris Bueller's Day Off where it's like, you know, anyone, anyone, Ben Stein is like just rambling on because he's he's monotone and he's probably talking about economics at a level that nobody gets. He's not tailoring it to his high school students so that, you know, they want to stay in the economics class. So our scientists, engineers, anyone listening, you need to think about your audience and what better way than to think about, okay, I have a five-year-old niece or nephew that I want them to know what I do. Can I break it down for them? And, and if they can understand it, then, you know, Ken and Michelle can understand it. And, and your, your friend that's not a chemist understand it, who might be the world's foremost rocket scientist or something, could be an extremely accomplished person, but they may not get chemistry because that's not what they studied. I mean, maybe rocket scientists do. That's maybe not the best explanation, but, you know, another type of engineer. Exactly. And something you, you, you mentioned something that reminds me of a, a yet another story. Some of the most infuriating conferences, meetings, presentations that I see are the ones where the speaker knows that it's a general audience, and yet they're trying to bury you in mathematics that, dare I say, nobody really cares about except for like two other people in the room full of a hundred. And you know, there's a time and a place for said detail and presentation, but when you're at a general conference, mm, know your audience. Speaking of game-changing teams, so we, we've definitely touched on them in the past few questions, but something we know um, uh, you had brought up and we'd love to hear you talk about is uh, what makes your team so unique? You mentioned they're fantastic, awesome people, love sharing memes, do amazing work. What makes them so special and so geared to help uh, face the challenges before them? My favorite, one of my favorite questions ever. So I am a thorough believer of this quote, as cringeworthy as it may be. Teamwork makes the dream work. I would not be where I am or have accomplished what we have, what I have, without my team. The reason I love my team, besides them being great people, I mean, you know, we hang out off hours, you know, go hiking, do whatever. Life is good, not during the pandemic, but you know how it is. The people make the team and teamwork makes the dream work. Our team is very unique in the fact that we have 10 people and every single individual has a completely different background. Some have a PhD in organometallic chemistry. Some have a PhD in straight up polymers. Other people have a background in catalysis or analytical chemistry. The list goes on. Our group spans, if you go into generational theory, we are comprised of gen, I think even gen Z right now, all the way up to uh, baby boomer. Uh, one is about to retire though. Generational um, differences, non-existent in my group. We don't, you know, we do not re really put too much stock in that. My group, the group that I'm in, the group that I have the pleasure and the privilege to run is responsible for the enjoyment of coming to work every day and getting the mission done. Why, to finish up the question, why does our group uh, work as well as it does? I do also believe in project buy-in. If you are excited about your project, if you really, really enjoy what you do and you enjoy the people, ooh, mm, that is what's gonna make things a lot better in your work day, especially when it's a one hour commute each way. Because think about it, if you have an amazing, take, okay, you have to have both. Good people, good projects. If you have good projects, but the people are awful, you're not going to want to work there. Vice versa. If you have great people, but the projects suck, the millennial in me is going to say, well, what do I do? What, what is what I'm doing right now affecting in the long run? What is what I, you know, what, what does it matter? You have to have that marriage of both good work and good people. And the reason that my group is successful is because of both of those. But I have to restate this. My success 
is because of my group. And I'm exceptionally proud and honored to serve them as, uh, as a group leader. And that's one of the one of the things that AFRL has really, really, uh, it makes AFRL stand out is the the opportunities afforded to its personnel, civilian, military, contractor. It doesn't matter. And how inspirational is that? Like it sounds like you have the oceans eleven of teams, like these teams of experts all working together to get a goal done, and, and that's amazing. Like to hear that, um, it's not any individual stands out. It's you guys working together to make this happen. Like that really shows. Like you said with communications, it's the team working and living together that makes the mission possible. And I think that's an important aspect to hit on here as we kind of round things out that um, as we've touched on the podcast, there's a level of um, expectation that, like you said, if you're in a field, of course, you know what you're doing and you, you want to be knowledgeable in your team. But um, one big thing that people feel is a barrier, especially in government or can feel as daunting is you have to be an expert. You have to be on top of it, unrivaled in many respects. But you, like you pointed out, you learn so much more on the job than you may even in schooling like that. that I can even attest for me. Like I came prepared. I was definitely qualified, but I've learned more in the past two years than I did Oh, the prior five, which is amazing. It just goes to show you're willing to take talent and help it grow. And that's such an important part um, of the AFRL mission. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. So let me give you a generic breakdown of a PhD in chemistry. Four years undergrad, usually we skip the master's and you get a PhD. Average time to completion is five years. So somebody once told me, once you get your PhD, a couple of different quotes come to mind. You realize that you know nothing and you know so much you are an expert in something so tiny because it's such a small subfield and that's incredibly humbling. Really what the PhD awards is the ability to, criti or to really develop your critical thinking skills. So I'm very glad to hear that you say that you have learned more in the past two years than you did in five in school, because I wholeheartedly agree with that. I have learned more about this field in the past five, almost five years that I've been at AFRL. I didn't know anything about what I currently do when I started. Now, I knew the chemistry involved with it, like how to make certain classes of molecules and materials, sure. but. You know, if, if you were to say, Cam, in 2015, when I graduated, did I know uh, what electric propulsion was? Dude, I didn't even know that that was a thing. I had no idea that was a thing. Well, that's, I mean, wonderful to hear in terms of not only teaching, working with teams, uh, communications, the cool tech you did. I mean, we, we really covered a lot of topics today about your awesome career, Cam. So we just want to say thank you so much for meeting with us today and helping inspire our audience to not only get out there and live their dreams, but know that the lab has a home for many people, uh, especially if you love chemistry. There's a place for you. Anytime. It has been my absolute pleasure and delight. Hopefully we can do it again if you and your listeners are willing the, I just have one parting quote for everybody, and I, I really, really just feel compelled to say this. If you're new to STEM, if you're just starting out and it seems intimidating or daunting, I don't care whether you're a high school student, elementary school, or a postdoc or a grad student, wherever you may be, just know that, I mean, it, what you're going through in terms of it being daunting, it, that, that feeling is normal. But don't let it stop you. The United States, and well, as well as the entire world, let's be honest, we need the next generation of scientists and engineers. Don't be afraid of getting your hands dirty. You know, hard work obviously is important, but, you know, follow your heart. And if that's science, you know, reach out. There are opportunities at AFRL. And uh, even if you don't necessarily want to work for the government full time, you know, it, there are a lot of resources that AFRL has to offer. That is the perfect ending point. Thank you so much again. And folks, just like Cam said, please check out our website and reach out to local officials that may be connected to AFRL or even through STEM programs when outreach kind of picks up more in person or even over a Zoom like this. We're here to help you. There's one last thing. And if it makes it into the podcast, great. Uh, even though we are two and one, the Dallas Cowboys are still the greatest team uh, ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again, Cam. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thanks for all the deadpan humor. <laughs> See ya. 
Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. And remember, stay curious. Logging off.